طيب بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه واتبع هداه وبعد First of all I'd like to thank everyone uh, for coming and I wish you a, a, a happy and meaningful Ramadan inshallah So tonight we'll be talking about spiritual transformation and how we can utilize the month of Ramadan uh, to reach that level. So basically there are two parts in that discussion. The first one is that, is that journey, how it looks like, what, to tell the story of the heart. And this is important because we cannot work on the heart without knowing the details, without knowing the events that we all share. We all share the same events in that story of the heart. And then how can we revive the heart through Ramadan? Uh, regarding the first part, the story of this heart, and it is my story and your story and the story of humanity in general, I'd like to ask to start with an ultimate question. One of the ultimate questions that would help us navigate that story. Why are we here? Why are we here on earth? You might say to worship Allah. <clears throat> there are many ways of uh, answering this question. There are many ways of answering this question. And it is because there are many ways of approaching it. Today I want to approach that question from a different angle that you're used to. Uh, we'll approach this question from the angle of, from the angle of uh, what is so special about humans? What is so special about the human experience? Because this can help us understand what is our purpose here in life? What is our spiritual purpose in life? And to make this easy, I would say as humans, we have three main components. We have the body and we have the soul. And you can say here we have the mind or what the Quran calls the heart because in the Quran the heart can think. In the Quran the heart thinks. So with regards to the body, the body makes you inclined towards lusts and desires. It's more about desires. By the way, some of these desires are are perfectly fine, they are for survival. But desires is not only about eating and drinking and, and relations. Desires could be, we have a desire to dominate, we have pride, we have arrogance, we have dominance, we have all of these qualities that uh, most of them would be satanic as some scholars say. So we have these desires of the body and we have originally desires also for the soul to connect with the higher being, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, attributes like love, like compassion, uh, like humility would fall into that category. But where is the problem? How does the problem start? The problem starts when these two, the body and the soul, interact. And they interact through the means of some challenges. There are many challenges in life that would ignite that, uh, that conflict between what the body needs and what the soul needs. So things like the dunya itself, uh, money, uh, relations, uh, sometimes trials and tribulations in life could ignite that, uh, that conflict between the body and the soul. So with our interactions with the, with the difficulties and the challenges of life, there will be usually that conflict between the body and the soul. But Allah gave us a, a, a gift, and that is the heart or the mind. This mind would observe what is going on and would actually guide us to take the right decision. But remember that this heart could also get sick. So depending on how healthy, spiritually healthy this heart is, it will guide or misguide. Scholars say it has also gates. What you see would affect your heart. What you hear would affect your heart. So with this interaction in mind 
and with these ingredients and components, you understand that you're so special among other creatures of Allah Azza wa Jal. With these inner actions, these inner actions will lead to the rise of your nafs, who you are. Some people would be so inclined towards the body and towards the haram, and they neglect the soul absolutely. And these would, uh, would, 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 would actually give rise to nafs, which is called al-ammara bisu, the nafs that commands evil. So the nafs is the byproduct of the, uh, of the interaction between the body and the soul. And our job in life is to reach a higher, lo- a higher uh, level of nafs that is pleasing to Allah. So that is why I started with this question, why are we here? What is so special about us are these components that do not exist in other uh, creatures. So this will lead us to discuss seven levels of the nafs. In Muslim tradition, scholars would classify the nafs into seven levels. And the reason I am mentioning this is to choose for, your, for yourself what kind of level you desire to be in and what is your level now. And then we'll talk about the classical way of, uh, of uh, elevating ourselves spiritually and then how Ramadan can be utilized for that. Uh, so with that reactions, uh, the reactions between the body and the soul with the observation of the heart, we have seven categories of people. Some will be inclined to the desires of the body, basically to the haram desires of the body. And this will give rise to the nafs that commands evil. The nafs that commands evil. And it is mentioned in the Quran. This nafs starts doing the haram, and this haram would be ignited by a thought. And if this thought is not treated, the thought will become uh, an intention to do the haram. If the intention is not treated, it will become a determination. If the determination is not treated, it would become an act. If not stopped, it will be a habit. If not stopped, it could be your destiny. That is part of the progressive dangers of this commanding evil nafs. What is more dangerous is that this nafs, because uh, uh, you didn't take care of, care of the soul at all, and you gave, you gave full liberty to this body and what the body requires. You could reach a point here when, uh, when you do not see anything wrong in what you're doing. So you become so attached to the haram and to the wrong, to the point that you're pleased with it, you can do it in public, uh, you're proud of doing it, and you can even call people unto embracing these kind of evil acts. Uh, it's not easy to reach that level uh, quickly. It takes time, actually. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَطَوَّعَتْ لَهُ نَفْسُهُ قَتْلَ أَخِيهِ For the two brothers of, uh, of Adam, when one of them killed the other, the Quran says he didn't kill his nafs first. Uh, made it easy for him to to accept the idea of murdering a person. So that is the first commanding nafs, the the first nafs that commands evil. The second nafs is that this nafs is awake. It recognizes the conflict between the body and the soul, and it desires the good, and it starts doing the good, but sometimes it fails to stay on on the right path, and it uh, and it and it it, uh, it could easily uh, uh, fall into sinning, but as it falls into sinning, it feels guilty and turns back to Allah, and this is called the nafs al lawama. Lawama means uh, the 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 self blaming nafs, the self blaming nafs. This nafs is not uh, it's not a bad level, even though it commits sins but it is awake, it has a goal that I am in my journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it sticks to the basic practice of the deen, but sometimes 
uh, it could uh, it could fall into sin. And if it did, it turns back to Allah quickly. And this keeps going on. So this nafs is on and off in haram. Is this a bad level? No. What is good about this level of nafs is that it is still recognizes the haram as haram and the halal as halal. Here in the commanding evil nafs, now you see the halal as haram and the haram as halal easily. But here you move to another level. You see the haram as haram and the halal as halal, even if you do uh, you, you commit a sin. So basically this is a nafs when you're on and off uh, the, uh, the right track. This is still a good nafs. The Quran did make an oath of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة Which means, I do swear by the day of judgment. And I do swear by the blaming, the self-blaming nafs. Why? Because it is important. And it is an indication that on the day of judgment, the more you, you judge yourself in this life and you hold yourself accountable for what you're doing, the more, the easier the judgment will be for, the day, for you on the day of judgment. Because that connection between the day of judgment and the self-blaming nafs indicates that there is a connection uh, between them. Uh, this nafs, in order to, to be on, on and off, as I said, this is not a bad level. This is actually a good level. That is why never give up. If you commit a sin, do not make this sin define who you are. Turn back to Allah. Come to the masjid. Do your salah. Make this sajda. Your sujood is your renewal of your covenant with Allah. If you're off, your sujood will turn you, your, your good spiritual level on. And this is a good level in itself. So never give up. Do not let the shaitan say, uh, you have been off track for a long time and now you want to act like a good Muslim. You're not. No, you are. You're not perfect and you're not expected to be perfect. This is an important point in this journey. That is why uh, maybe you didn't expect me to start with this, but this is important to tell the story of the heart because you cannot start a journey and you do not know what it looks like. But here you are, here, this is how it looks like. And this is the level that we do not wish anyone, any human being to fall under, under this category. The second is the self-blaming on and off. But this needs striving, self-striving. It needs mujahada. And there is a great promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا Those who strive for in our path will guide them our ways. One way of divine guidance in this level, you're on and off, on and off, and you insist to stay on the right track. Allah will guide you more and grant you this second or third level, which is al-mulhama, the inspired nafs. What is inspired nafs? So this is the nafs that is being inspired to do good. The conflict between the body and the soul now comes to a minimum level. Because here you're more inspired to do good. And instead of all of these haram thoughts that you used to have, now you will have more of good thoughts to emulate and good thoughts to, to carry out. And this is, again, the, the, the inspired nafs. And this is a transitional state between the self-blaming and what we call, what the Quran calls, an nafsul mutma'inna. Mutma'inna, you can say the serene nafs. What is the serene nafs? This is mentioned in the Quran. And nafs al mutmainna it indicates that it has this kind of a spiritual stability, uh, serenity, meaning the conflict between the body and the soul is now absent. And you are inclined more uh, towards the, the, the soul and towards man managing the body. When we say conflict, we do not mean the... Uh, the body desires are evil. No, it means it needs to be managed. Because if we, do, if we fail to manage what the body requires, it could lead us into the 
the, the, the commanding evil nafs. So here in the serene nafs, in the nafs al-mutma'inna, we do not have, suffer from that conflict anymore. If you see wine, you do not have a desire to drink it. You have a distaste towards the haram. This is when you reach a nafs al-mutma'inna. It is so stable that the haram does not challenge it. But one way also is because you close the gateways of the haram. You do not put yourself to a test. And here comes the rule of the sharia and the law. There are things that are haram, even if you are the greatest servant of Allah. There are haram things that, and there are boundaries that you cannot cross. Because you do not want to put yourself to the test. So this is the serene nafs. Not only you, uh, the, this good nafs can become uh, stable in, in, in its relationship with the body and the soul, but it can, be, it can reach another level that some scholars call uh, an nafs radiya. You become satisfied. You're satisfied with your hijab. You're satisfied with all of these haram red flags. It's not uh, the conflict is absent, but you're satisfied with it. You accept it from your heart. And when you do that, you reach another level, which is a nafs al mardiyah the nafs that Allah is satisfied with. And these two, to be satisfied with, so you become an object of divine satisfaction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayatuha nafsu al-mutuma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya. So radiyya and mardiyya. Some scholars would say, we do not need all of these uh, classifications. It's just the mutuma'inna, and it, and it starts with inspiration to do good, and all of the others would be just different levels of al-mutma'inna. And that is not a problem, that's fine. So Ibn al-Qayyim said, these are different levels of al-mutma'inna itself. There is the last step, which is the al-kamila, the complete. That starting from to, uh, to the complete, this is when sometimes I, one of my du'as will be, alhamdulillah, that there are prophets. Alhamdulillah that there are close servants of, of Allah on this earth. Because this is why we're here. So that these great examples will be demonstrated. You're here to witness for yourself what kind of nafs you have. You know the evil, the committing evil nafs, one of the attributes of this nafs is rebellion. Some people deny Allah because they want to be Allah. They deny God because they want to be God. They do not like to accept this idea of obeying, even if it would be obeying Allah. But th that is why when the angels said, Are you going to create species that would shed blood Allah and corrupt the land? Allah said, I know what you do not know. Now, when you work on your nafs, when you work on your nafs, you will be meant by this phrase, I know what you do not know. I know that among those people who are being challenged with the physical and the spiritual uh, aspects, there will be some who would arise and some who would resist all of the haram temptations and incline towards the good and what pleases Allah. That is in itself a great reason for this creation. So what kind of nafs do you want to achieve? This is the story of the heart. And that is why Muslim scholars throughout the ages wrote, there is a great wealth of material in Islam on how to move from the evil to the self-blaming, to the inspired, to the serene. And this makes sense of your life. You're living for a purpose. You're living for a purpose. The more you are interested in this topic and in this journey, the more human you be. The more human you become. Because this is who you are. The people here in the commanding evil nafs, 
they stopped uh, all of these great blessings that Allah gave, gave them. Yeah, Allah gave you that reason and that heart to think with, they blocked it. The earring and the eyes for knowing good things, they blocked it and used it for the haram. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said regarding them, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They have hearts that they do not understand through. وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لَا يُبْصُرُونَ بِهَا And they have eyes that they do not see with. And they have ears that they do not hear with. Those people, they go to, they choose to go to a lower level, the level of the animals. This is not being insulting to the animals because the animal is not blamed for demonstrating what the animal is. But for a human being who's blessed with reasoning and knowing Allah and then choosing to fall into the, the animal level, this is when it becomes blaming. So uh, these are the seven levels of nafs that, that, is, that, is, uh, that explains the idea of a spiritual elevation. Now, how did Muslim scholar uh, help us move from one nafs to another? This is my second point. And then the third point, how can we utilize Ramadan to carry out that program? So Muslim scholar said we need uh, four things in order to move from one kind of nafs to another kind of nafs. First, they said you need hal, you need a spiritual state. And then you need an exercise. You need exercises. And then you need nutrition. And then you need a good environment. Think of this like building strong muscles. What do you need for building strong muscles? You need to be inspired, but that is not enough. All of the videos you watch about building muscles will make no sense if you do not start exercising. So you need to, to exercise more and you need to have good nutrition. Otherwise, the exercise will not help, could be even dangerous. And, with, and above that, you need good environment. Because if you're exposing yourself to polluted air, for example, that could also affect your body. So we, didn't, we need these four levels also when it comes to building uh, spiritual muscles. That is appropriate. So that when it comes to the, the spiritual state that will motivate us to, uh, to start on that journey, we can list uh, at least two major things. We would need yaqadha, awakening. Okay. And we would need dua. Awakening can be achieved by knowing the story of the heart that I told you. It awakens you that I am here for a purpose. There are many different ways of awakening the heart, but it would be beyond the scope of this. Uh, brief class uh, to discuss. Prayer du'as, because this journey is not done uh, through your skills. It's done with the help of Allah. So you need to start this journey with knowing what you're going to encounter and why is this important. And your, your du'as, these are key things to start your journey. You need two major exercises for this journey. The first one is is fikr, which is contemplation. And the second one is dhikr, remembrance of Allah and, and, and reminding yourself and, 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 and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things like la ilaha illallah, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, astaghfirullah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are basic adhkar that would uh, Remember we said the heart can get sick or healthy. This will help you develop a healthier heart. This heart, when it is preoccupied with dhikr, it will be very sensitive to the haram. 
And if it committed the haram, it will be, it will, it will, it will remember right away and turn back to Allah. Allah described the righteous as if they are touched by the shaitan, meaning uh, the shaitan whisper anything to them, they remember and they turn back to Allah. And we need uh, so we mentioned here that we have these are the this is the sorry this is the nutrition right so here are the exercises sorry that is a mistake so the, the exercise would be number two. There are, they said, in order to manage this conflict between the heart and the soul, you need to manage four things. You manage what you eat, food. You manage what you say, talking. And you manage uh, also sleeping and mingling with others. So these are four exercises that you need to, uh, to have. And when you do that, you move to the nutrition. You fill the heart with the fikr and, and the dhikr of Allah. It's very interesting that in order to develop that devoted heart, you need to manage these four things. What you eat and how you eat. So overeating would, would make your relationship to Allah slow. By the way, gaining weight does not always mean you're overeating. So you do not have to make that uh, assumption. So managing how you eat and what you eat is important. The Quranic uh, prescription here would be moderation. Because when you overeat, uh, you give more, uh, the chance to do the haram could be greater. And then talking a lot. You need to manage this because we want you to have intimacy talking to Allah. We want you to have kind of a spiritual intimacy even when you are alone. So this is something to manage. Sleeping also could keep you away from munajatullah azawajal. So they have these exercises because the, before they give you the nutrition, you should develop these habits first. And then mingling with others also could be, I am talking here, mingling with others, when you spend more time with people in a way that is irrelevant to, uh, to your actual needs. So minimize this mingling and keep it to the what the shar'a requires of you. Spending time with your family, spending time with your rahim, your uh, close relatives, uh, someone is sick, all of these uh, essential spiritual aspects. But to be on Facebook for two hours just for killing time, you did not start that spiritual journey or there is something wrong. So again, make sure that you do not uh, waste your time. This is another way of saying, uh, minimize that mingling with others. Because the more you mingle with others, the more you're exposed to hear bad things or see bad things. And these are two major gates of the heart that could corrupt it. So I would start with that uh, inspiration. And then the four uh, things they would manage. And then fikr and dhikr. And then the environment is to be always in a faith-filled environment, like your message, your local message. This is a place where your heart should be attached to. Uh, you have good company. You have good close friends that you can rely on, on getting your nafs elevated. And you have also a sheikh that you can refer to whenever you face a problem. So they gave us this kind of four elements in this journey. We'll move to the uh, last major question. How can we utilize Ramadan to apply this program and get ourselves more elevated? <clears throat> uh, 
if we're saying the first step is about awakening, if we agree that the first step is about awakening, in Ramadan, there are many ways of awakening. So now we'll list a program for Ramadan that in light of what we mentioned. Okay. So in Ramadan, there is one great element that would uh, ignite our spirit to do the uh, to start to embark on that journey. The first one is when you fast, you have that feeling of iftiqar, that feeling of uh, dependency, right? When you fast for these long hours, for 18 hours, you develop that sense of dependency and that sense of maybe also brokenness. You may be surprised if I told you that this is a shortcut way to Allah. One of the barriers that keeps people away from Allah is that feeling of independence. Man transgress the limits when they develop that feeling of independence. Now, in Ramadan, you have an exercise. Ramadan is all about exercise. It is an exercise to stay away from food and drinks that you take for granted, to see how you look like without Allah. Without Allah, you're not here. Without Allah, we cannot be here. Without Allah, we cannot survive. So why are you away from him? If Allah is the reason why you're here and you, why you're surviving, the logical conclusion is that you maintain a strong and purposeful and meaningful connection with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that feeling of dependency, of iftiqar, should ignite you to connect with Allah. And this is one of the cries of the soul to combat the, uh, the pressures of the body. Does it make sense? So this is the first feel. Some people, some people, they get very angry in Ramadan and they justify any bad behavior because they are fasting. And this means that they do not understand what fasting is for. They do not know that this is an exercise so that you master yourself. Because when you master yourself, you can start on that journey. In Ramadan, there is that, uh, that call. Uh, I need to eat. I need to drink. I need to do this. And you're saying no. So this is an exercise to say no so that you will be in control and, and turn back. And this is what we all need. So that is the, 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 the first uh, thing, dependency. This dependency also will ignite dua and prayer. When you feel in need, because sometimes our skills and, and Allah's blessings for us, ironically, keeps us away from Allah. Because you feel developing that sense of independence. I am healthy, I have insurance, I have money, I have this. And these blessings that are meant to ignite more gratitude would lead to the problem of turning away from Allah. But fasting comes to break that routine and remember who you are. Because when you remember who you are, you can easily recognize who he is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it ignites prayer as well. And this is what we need for the first step in Ramadan. We need to use that dependency and prayer as igniting our uh, the, 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 the soul cries for more elevation. The second thing in Ramadan that we need to put in practice is to manage the four elements of food, eating, sleeping, and mingling with people. These are four mandatory things to... Uh, to manage in general, and it is easy to manage in Ramadan. So if you want to start that journey, Ramadan makes it easy for you. Because in Ramadan, you can manage uh, how you eat. In Ramadan, we have, how many meals do we have in Ramadan? 
we have two meals because we skip one. Sometimes people, because they skipped one during the daytime, they make up for what they missed during the night. And that means they did nothing. Actually, it is unhealthy. So you're missing a meal for a reason. This doesn't mean you're not eating healthy, but it, it means that you have to manage how you eat. So I would say, number, let's give you now some insights on, what, on how you break your fast, because this is important. How you, usually we talk about how to fast, but we do not talk about how to break the fast at Maghrib. How would the Prophet ﷺ break the fast in Maghrib? And that is why this is a great chance for, uh, to, for spiritual elevation that people miss because they fast for cultural reasons. Month of Ramadan becomes the month of eating and more food and you need more income for Ramadan. And that is the opposite of what Ramadan is for. So how the Prophet ﷺ would, uh, would break his fast first at Maghrib, ease your body back to the process of digesting. Uh, uh, ease your body back to the process of digesting. How? When you break your fast with uh, water and dates, as the Prophet ﷺ did. So that is your first step. The second step, take some rest. And this is a, a time for Salatul Maghrib. So do not eat right away. So you're breaking your fast with a couple of dates as the Prophet did. And if he didn't find dates, the Prophet ﷺ would break his fast with water. And then have some rest. I'll make wudu, I'll do maghrib, I'll say the adhkar. Or if you can do it in the masjid, it would be ideal. Or at home, it would be perfect. But adhan and then eating right away, it's not even healthy. You need to ease your body first. And, and number three, make sure that you do not overeat and you eat your regular meal. You can replace that with a healthy meal that has healthy ingredients. But overeating in Ramadan doesn't make sense, physically or spiritually. The Quran says, Eat and drink and do not fall into israf. Israf is anything more than moderation. And then the Quran says, إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ Allah does not love those who, are, who fall into israf. More than moderation. Does not love them. This is, uh, this is the Quran. It's not just a medical advice. It's also a spiritual advice. So when you manage what you eat, you will have, this will soften your heart. And this is needed in the journey towards Allah Azza wa Jal. And by the way, it's all about habits. If you get used to the idea of eating healthy food with healthy ingredients at a specific time, if you try to overeat, it will be very hard for you to do. So it's all about habits. We're not talking about depriving yourself of anything. We're talking about developing the right habits. Sometimes when I overeat, it it could take uh, hours to go back to, to the, my normal condition. Maybe I, I would have to skip a meal because of overeating. So this is what, you need, what we need to manage in, uh, in Ramadan. Number four, stay away from any kind of unhealthy food in Ramadan. These sugary drinks and sugary food that would give you more energy and then you use it for haram. No, keep these, this... Uh, haram energy to the uh, to to the minimum, because we want to have a program for qiyam. We want to have dhikr, and overeating does not help with that. And Ramadan is a perfect time to develop these uh, good, healthy, and spiritual habits. So this is uh, one insight on how you manage. Uh, uh, your food in Ramadan. And by the way, remember the, the four elements. This is the first one, the food. We also have to manage uh, talking to others. Maybe uh, you minimize your Facebook time or you stop the Facebook at all in Ramadan. This is something you can fast from. This is something that you can fast from. We want a devoted heart 
that is not distracted by the environment outside. When you reach a nafsul mutma'inna, I can say, keep talking to people, guiding them, advising them. That would not be a waste of the heart. But we want to set this heart first on the right track. So these exercises are mandatory. Managing how you sleep, oversleeping is also unhealthy and spiritually unhealthy. Because you will miss Qiyamul Layl, you will miss regular Salah, you will miss time for Dhikr. You know, some scholars say the reason why we say, uh, uh, the reason why we say Ghufranak after when we're leaving the bathroom, you know why? Why do we say, oh Allah, we ask you for forgiveness? What is the relationship? They said, some of them said, because you miss time of Dhikr. Dhikr is haramed in the bathroom, you missed it. So you're asking Allah for, to forgive that time you missed in dhikring. Some would say, no, it's, it's more about you relieved yourself of this harm. So uh, that is uh, physical health. And you're asking for divine forgiveness because this is your spiritual health. So when you're physically and spiritually healthy, that is the, the best thing you could look for. But the idea that Muslims are sensitive to this uh, uh, time they spend. You know there is Allah and, the, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the everlasting and the real existent. So the conclusion is to connect with the source as much as you could. And everything we do would be with, with the muraqaba of Allah, with Allah in mind. This is when our life becomes meaningful and purposeful. Uh, same thing with mingling with people. You have your programs to, to minimize and these decisions on how you eat, how you minimize the time with people, how you minimize time with uh, uh, talking to others uh, for, uh, about irrelevant things. How many times do we even sometimes repeat the same conversations we have with the same people? Uh, if you do not feel connected with Allah alone, that you need that exercise because these are exercises to train yourself to be satisfied with the presence of Allah when people are absent. So these are four uh, things that we can manage in Ramadan. Uh, also in Ramadan, the third exercise that we can do in Ramadan So in Ramadan, we we'll utilize our feeling of fatigue and dependency to turn back to Allah and say more du'as meaningfully. And in Ramadan, we'll manage the four elements so that the heart will be ready to communicate with Allah. And this leads me to the third point, which is the nutrition's, the nutrition's for the heart in Ramadan. There is no doubt Ramadan is, spiritually speaking, an intensive course for nutrition in Ramadan, for nutrition, for spiritual nutrition. In Ramadan, you have, uh, you have, more, you have more prayers and more salah, I mean the ritual prayers. And of course, we have fasting. In salah, you have charity to give. You feel for others after you experience the, the, the pain of starvation for a few uh, moments, for a few hours. So you feel inclined to give others as well. We have more dhikr in Ramadan. Or basically, these are things that you must have in your schedule. So every night in Ramadan, to make my Ramadan more meaningful and a chance for spiritual elevation, I have a special time of dhikr. I have a special time of fikr, contemplation. So dhikr, I would say, la ilaha illallah hundred times. I would say, astaghfirullah hundred times. I would say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hundred times. If we do not do that in Ramadan, it will be very hard in, in, in other than Ramadan because Ramadan gives us a great opportunity for our heart to respond more actively and more positively. 
because of the exercises of dependency and the exercises of managing food, people talking and sleeping. Uh, so make sure that you have a program for dhikr. Uh, it could be, let's say, after I break my, that, my fast with that moderate meal, I have 20 minutes of dhikr right after fasting or 30 minutes, and then I come for taraweeh. And then I'll do some dhikr when I go home and have wudu and sleep and wake up for fajr. Have that detailed program that would show that you're minimizing all of the, all of the gates of the heart that could lead to the haram and maximizing the nutrition of the heart. And the point is, uh, minimizing the bad and maximizing the good makes you experience that spiritual joy that you will decide not to miss after Ramadan. But if Ramadan comes and go without planning, without understanding what it is for, then uh, there will be no spiritual changes. So, uh, so more special uh, dhikr time. And, and a special uh, and salat al taraweeh if you cannot do it in the masjid because of what is going on, you can do it at home. You can read Quran in your taraweeh from your mushaf, that's fine. Um, giving also, giving your general sadaqat or your uh, or charity in general is absolutely recommended in Ramadan. Uh, so, uh, be, when you break your fast, as you're breaking the fast, be, or before you break the fast, you have a set of du'as. Remember that this journey cannot work without your sincere du'as, that you love to be with the mutma'inna, to be with the prophets and the great servants of Allah. Make sincere du'as and keep knocking at the door till it opens for you. And every one of us will be tested if this desire is really sincere and genuine. Because you keep knocking, you could keep knocking at the door, and the door doesn't doesn't open. It could take one or two or three years. If you're sincere and have genuine desire, you will keep knocking at the door. So do not give up. This is a journey, and that's why you have all of these years. It is a journey. It is an adventure. So be resilient spiritually, till that door is open. Till that door opens and Allah gives you that blessing of, of ilham and inspiration to do good till you reach the mutma'inna. Uh, we have also number uh, uh, fikr also uh, or contemplation. Contemplation is absolutely important in Ramadan as well. And let, give, maybe give you, let me give you just one example. At the time of Maghrib, what would you remember? What does Maghrib signal to you? What does Maghrib signal to you? Spiritually to me, I would say every day of Ramadan is like the story of this whole life. You kept striving for the sake of Allah and managed to please Allah and everything one time will be over. This is the same thing in life. Keep obeying Allah and one day it will be over, but you will be receiving the pleasure of Allah. Because after Ramadan, after you recognize that every day these difficulties are over, there is a day of Eid for you. And this is exactly what happens for us in this life. It is a challenge every day and every year, but when we maintain that sense of obedience and commitment to obedience, we'll be rewarded with, with the Eid when we die. So this is one way of contemplating about the sureness of this life, just with the few hours of fasting we have. Uh, number four, in, when it comes to the exercises we need to develop in Ramadan, three more minutes, okay. So in Ramadan, make sure that you create a faith-filled environment for yourself. Ideally, it would be the masjid. When you attend a dars in the masjid or the taraweeh in the masjid. And again, because of what is going on, it can be done at home. Again, 
as we mentioned. So this faith-filled environment is a key for spiritual elevation. If you have bad friends accompanying you, uh, bad friends with you, you need to minimize them or stop all of this kind of friendship at all. Because it makes your journey to Allah very slow. The last thing, because of we're running out of time, is that remember that fasting is an exercise to say no. No to any haram decision. And I wrote an article about this. Uh, it's available on the Mosque Foundation. Um, it's called Fasting and Self-Mastery. The Power of Saying No to Our Ego. The article will, will explain this. As I mentioned before, in fasting, your body is saying, I need water, and, say, and you're saying, no, wait till Maghrib. I need food, no, wait till Maghrib. In life, you will be called to do haram things. You can say, no, wait, wait till I get married. Wait till I have enough money. I do not want to use haram money. Wait till I do it in the right way. Someone is irritating you and, you're, and you want to respond in an aggressive way. And you're saying, no, control these, these uh, negative emotions and ne negative responses as well. So the people who use Ramadan as a justification for getting angry, they do not know that it is an exercise to stop the anger. Because the best thing to stop the anger is to to create these situations and then uh, and then do tarweed, fake it till you make it, act as if you're a patient person. Someone is irritating you and you're controlling yourself. It comes with exercises. The more you practice this, the the, the more it, it will be, the easier it will be for you. So again, uh, uh, to conclude, I, I mentioned three major uh, points. The first one the story of the heart and the different components that we have. And the second, the solution, the program for elevation. And how can we utilize Ramadan? I didn't give you exactly what to do, but you need to go home and write down your own schedule for Ramadan that would achieve these goals. Allah Ta'ala A'la wa A'lam wa jazakum Allah khairan ajma'in. Thank you, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, inshallah, we're going to open the floor now for questions and answering. Before we do that, though, I just want to mention that, inshallah, we're going to try and do it for like 10 minutes. And then we're going to ask the